Okay, thanks, thanks, Ian, and um, <coughs> good, good afternoon to everybody. It's now past the morning, so we're into the, the pre-lunch session, which is always a difficult one to get us through, but it's better than the post-lunch session, right? So whoever's... Oh, that's going to be uh, Kevin Rudd, isn't it? So we'll see what happens. So this session now, as, as Ian just said, I think we're looking at alliances and diplomacy in a shifting global order. And I should add my thanks at the beginning to New America and ASU for, for the, the last two days. It's been absolutely fantastic. Learned a great deal. And it's great that we have an opportunity as S&D Plus, I think, to... Um, put forward our, our wares as well. So, you know, this is a, a, a pretty vast topic, really, to try to cover in, in 60 minutes, um, but we'll give it a go, and we've got the A team here to do that, and I'll introduce people in a minute. Uh, and we've heard a lot yesterday, and a lot today already, about, this, about the changing global order. Um, and this panel is, I guess, focusing very much on the blue team sort of element of things, in terms of alliances and diplomacy, Australia, UK and, and Japanese perspectives. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll illuminate the various factors, domestic and international, that are driving perceptions, I guess, within these three countries uh, on the changing order. Uh, and that will, I think, influence things going forward uh, as well. And hopefully draw out some of these elements of continuity um, and change too uh, across the three countries. Recognizing, of course, that, you know, and it's come up already that we have elections <coughs> in the US this year in November <coughs> and the potential implications of that for security assurances, for extended deterrence guarantees and all those different things. Uh, but also recognizing, I think, that conflict escalation pathways these days are becoming increasingly complex given emerging and emerging disruptive technologies, you know, the, the growing importance of the space domain, <clears throat> and I think shifting alliance dynamics on the red team side, and I think that's something obviously that's come out a little bit and perhaps will come out of this session as well uh, now. So let me quickly introduce um, the A team uh, on, the, on, on, on the table here. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the order in the program, but that's not the order we're going to do the discussion in. So first of all, on, on the far end, we have my colleague John Bew, who's Professor of History and Foreign Policy at King's College London. He's currently Defence secu and Security Advisor to the Prime Minister in the UK, and for five years before that was, was the Foreign Policy Advisor to three Prime Ministers. So he sees Prime Ministers off pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, yeah. is, is that a, not my fault. Is that a skill? So, I don't know, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah, powerful. <laughs> Huge staying power. But he's, come, he's coming back to Kings, which is all good. Um, then we have John Blackson there in the middle. Uh, and John is director of ANU, Australian National University's North American Liaison Office, and professor of international security and intelligence studies uh, at ANU. And then finally, but not least, we have Yuki Tatsumi, who's the East Asia Program Co-Director and Japan Program Director um, at the Stimson Center. So, so we're going to start off this session. We're going to run. I'm going to basically throw the same questions at each of the panelists, but to get them to look at it from a different perspective uh, in terms of their, where they sit, I guess, um, on these issues. Um, and then we will um, open it up then for questions from the floor. We want to spend a lot of time kind of get that discussion on the floor uh, going uh, uh, as well. So I'm going to start off then. We're going to do this in a different order. We're going to start off with Yuki. Then we're going to go to John B. then to John Blackstone. And I can't call one John B and the other one John B because that's not going to work. I can say John B A or John B B. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see, see what happens there. So I'm going to start, start with Yuki. Um, so obviously we've got political change coming in Japan, you know, um, with, the, with Prime Minister Kishida stepping down, the Liberal Party lead and... Um, and what that means going going forward. We've had these recent you know, national security strategy at the back end of 22 with the national defense strategy and, and everything else too. So to begin with, I guess the first question for you is, you know, if you could say something about the sort of the key domestic debates that have influenced the sort of the current Japanese perspective about the shifting global order. And I guess with that, have the domestic debates, debates been shifting themselves and at what pace and why? Well, thank you for that question, and um, I would like to start by thanking um, ACU and uh, New America for this great opportunity, and great to be on the A-team, too. Yeah, it is A-team. Um, so, in response to your question, I promise I do not go back, I would not go back all the way to 1945, because it's a windy wide new world for Japan. So just, let's uh, focus on um, maybe like last five to seven years. So I would, I would, although I would have to take us all back to uh, December 2012, when the uh, late uh, former Prime Minister Abe came back to power. 
Mm. And the, uh, I would also direct you to fast forward about three months, um, his first visit that he made as the uh, prime, comeback prime minister to Washington, D.C., February 2013. There is a, um, a speech that he delivered at the uh, CSIS um, down the street. That's where he talked about how um, he sees Japan in the international community, first and foremost, as a defender of the commons and the, uh, and the, mo the staunchest ally of the United States in the Indo-Pacific region. And back then, it was called Pacific, Asia-Pacific. But that is really the vision that he laid out. If you look back, you really have to um, give, a, give a hats off to his uh, strategic foresight. He was definitely one of the one of the greatest visionary that the Japanese politics have uh, um, have uh, benefited to have, and uh, we're also very sad to uh, see him go a little bit too prematurely. Um, but that's where he that's the first time that really um, Japanese political leader um, put out the image of Japan and place of Japan as international in the international community as defender and up, um, the country that hopes international liberal order. And I think if you look toward the trend line since then, um, Japan has been steadily but surely moving toward that direction. And the uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, dramatically, it really came out in the form of a 2022 national security strategy, national defense strategy, and also defense build-up plan. And where it, when Mr. Abe was underseeing, overseeing these, uh, net, you know, minding, the attending the national security policy for the country. Japan was still within the. You go back, you know, going back to your question, John. Um, debate about where Japan is in terms of the strategic environment it's been placed in, where it should go in the alliance with the United States, where you, it sees itself as the community of nations and what kind of role it plays, there was still shifting debate. And I would, uh, it, within the last 10 years or so, that really rapidly came to a more of a, more of a, almost a, almost a bipartisan consensus within J Japanese domestic political discourse even, that the Japan is now living in increasingly precarious, you know, precarious, um, unsafe, uh, environment, so sense of insecurity externally is very, very big, and it really dominates the uh, mind of the policymakers in Japan across, pretty much across the party line, with a small majority of uh, still kicking and kicking and aliving the uh, Japanese Communist Party and the uh, Social Democrats. Um, and then I think the biggest driver of that conversation was two were were two mainly. One is the, uh, as we all know, uh, meteoric rise of uh, China, but at the same time, ascendance of China as more of an aggressive nation that kind of pick and choose which international order and rules that it wants to follow. And now with uh, economic prowess and military, military might to try to bend the rules for the, you know, for the rules that it doesn't fit to its convenience. Secondly, um, there is a growing trend in, in, within Japan about this perception of the uh, decli um, declining United States national power across the board, but then more importantly, um, U.S. as the uh, steady ally for Japan and Indo-Pacific and beyond. And that really brought home to the point during the uh, Trump administration. And now we're going back to, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, back to the future kind of scenario where we're all probably nail-biting watching the uh, tonight's uh, presidential debate between uh, former President Trump and the Vice President Harris. So during that time, um, there was this, it, Japan already had the increasing sense of insecurity on its own. And when you look outside and look at the United States, which is really the only treaty ally, um, it also looks at uh, United States as relatively declining and kind of a, regardless of what comes out as an um, official government document, um, increasingly internal looking when it, comes to, when it comes to the priority order of its national policy. So that really is driving the conversation now these days. Um, and then I think it only, you will only see that um, getting more intense um, as, as uh, Japanese media, who actually has by far worldwide the best coverage of American presidential politics outside, outside US, um, to, down to the primary. Um, that's, that's where the uh, 
interest of the uh, majority of the, not just public, but the uh, political, political leaders rise. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, excellent. So to sort of come back on this sort of the, uh, the continuity and change question, and you talked a little bit about continuity and change there uh, already. Could you further reflect a bit on that? Because if you think back to different moments in right. Japanese sort of post sort of Cold War history, it's had different moments where it's worried about the external threat and also about the US mm -hmm. reliability as a partner. I mean, could you think, could you say a little bit more about sort of those sort of aspects that are just continuations of those things that are, I mean, you've talked a lot about the change with Abe and things like that and the more assertiveness. So continuity, and there's a big continuity, um, even though Japan begins to introduce some of the measures that were frankly unthinkable five years ago, and the time has caught up to uh, what the Prime Minister Abe was, um, Prime Minister Abe was upholding when he, when he came back to the office in 2012, which is more robust defense on its defense capability on its own self, including um, entertaining the option of uh, introducing the uh, yep. counter-strike capability. Um, more robust uh, defense, uh, defense, uh, defense budget like resourcing, and uh, more, you know, basically making the uh, those military service more frankly attractive to uh, Japanese uh, Japanese people. Um, there are a couple of in inflection points even before Prime Minister Abe. Obviously, the biggest one was the uh, end of the cold uh, end of the Cold War. This is when Japan really find itself quite isolated because it doesn't it didn't have the mean to offer any kind of uh, national security related assistance to um, you know, not, you know, other, it, its uh, partner countries, let alone the United States. That, that, was, that was when Japan got into this uh, intense political debate just about what kind of support Japan could provide to the United States in the regional contingencies such as Korean Peninsula. Mm. So that was one inflection point. Um, second inflection point was uh, definitely a 9-11. Um, that really pushed Japan further out into what it could do, think harder about what it could do uh, beyond the immediate vicinity of Northeast Asia. And I would argue that um, the third inflection point was, uh, oddly enough, it was domestic disaster. You all remember triple disaster back in 2011, mm -hmm. tsunami, earthquake, mm -hmm. and nuclear meltdown. And um, that was actually when um, Japanese public saw right in front of their eyes like what uh, the sacrifice that uh, its own military forces make for its own people. So that really shifted and turned almost 180, you know, 180, 180 on the uh, Japanese public's perception about the uh, self-defense force service, you know, service on its own merit. Then I would say, um, I would say for the, you know, Fourth inflection point, it's hard to pinpoint that inflection point, mm. but I would say the last, uh, last uh, five to seven years or so, um, Chinese increasing, increasing aggressiveness, not just by around its own neighborhood, around East China Sea, but then even more so for uh, South China Sea, which I'm sure John will talk about a little bit because it has a lot to do with uh, its relationship with Southeast Asia and a critical supply line and a shipping lane that Japan really depends on most of its uh, exports coming, coming in from abroad. Um, so I think uh, those are some of the, uh, some of the uh, if you say point, uh, those are some of the uh, juncture that I, would argue, uh, that I would identify. Yeah, thank you, Re really insightful. We may come back to some of the nuclear issues and some of, of the nuclear questions perhaps um, later on. So I'm gonna move on now to, to, to John over there on the far side. So we've just transitioned to a new Labour government. I don't know why I'm telling you this, right? I think you might know that. Um, after many years of a conservative administration, we've got this, the SDR process, the defence review process, starting off the back of the integrated review, the integrated review refresh, which you're the, the pen holder on. Um, so again, same question for you, really, is to, John, is to perhaps reflect a bit on some of the key domestic debates that have influenced where we are now in terms of British sort of strategic thinking, looking out at the world and the shifting global order, and the extent to which those domestic debates have been shifting, um, uh, and why. Thanks, Wynn. I um, uh, hope you can hear me okay. Uh, important caveat, I mean, yes, I was the pen holder of the last two UK national security strategies, but they are agreed collectively by ministers and government, which really means that all the clever bits are me, and <laughs> all the bits that are less clever, less prescient, are due to the restrictions of <coughs> politics and democratic life. Uh, that's that's my, my caveat. Um, uh, uh, so more, more seriously, I mean, any, any discussion of UK national security strategy in the modern era. We were joking in the green room how many times one of us would say since the end of the Cold War. I'm not going to do that. Um, 
but but really it's sort of it, it, to a to a significant extent starts with Brexit in 2016 and in the outworking of Brexit, which obviously changes a lot of uh, UK relationships. I say to a significant extent because sometimes those looking outside the UK, uh, at the UK and its posture and its foreign policy, I think overinterpret or misinterpret Brexit. So it's not the only factor, but it's a considerable factor that led to uh, a sort of renewed debate about Britain's place in the world, the instruments and tools it has. I saw Tony Blair speaking uh, just in the last few days about his new book, and, and, and very much, you know, still still in that space where where, where Brexit had a significant impact in um, uh, in the UK's place in the world. Um, that's the first observation. Second observation: your question was about domestic drivers for national security strategy. One of the things that has happened, um, perhaps ironically or unexpectedly, in the post-Brexit period is you've got a st uh, strong restoration of a bipartisan consensus on most foreign policy issues. Um, and that is essentially in fitting with the post-1945 pattern of the UK national security debate. So, so very striking, sitting in the gallery in the House of Commons for key moments like the announcement of an increase in defense spending or um, uh, key moments in Ukraine policy or AUKUS, the AUKUS announcement, the extent of that bipartisan consensus. It doesn't mean the debate is completely uniform, but it is sort of returned in a, in a significant way. That's been very important to the Labour Party under Keir Starmer's leadership after Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, in much sort of foreign policy, national security area, the argument is for continuity um, on things like Ukraine policy as well. So I think that's, that's a really important thing, and it's borne out by public attitudes. So the polling we used to have done uh, by the national security uh, communications team basically speaks to that quite deep commitment and belief in and understanding of the importance of things like the NATO alliance, which polls it's in, in the 70s. Uh, in terms of support for. Um, so, so those sort of, uh, in some ways, actually, in a, a post-Brexit period, those, those, the, the sacred vows of UK national security strategy have been sort of restated again. Um, and I think that's important. And then anyone who's been in the UK in the last three years will see the Ukrainian flag fluttering in towns and villages in all four nations of the United Kingdom. Um, uh, north and south of England in many different places. And that, that sort of feeling um, um, of, of sort of support for Ukraine, again, runs very deeply. It's still polling in the 70s for people who are willing to support, want to support Ukraine for as long as it takes and are willing to take economic pain to do so. So there's certain sort of core fundamentals we think are important as, as, as a backdrop. That's, that's a sort of the domestic politics. The next question is, is sort of how that translates into sort of national security strategy. And I think it is fair to say we are in a period or have been in a period in which some of the first order assumptions about our place in the world and about the international environment have changed. Um, and we reflected on that in the process of writing the 2021 national security strategy. And we say, first of all, Brexit means we must change the way we operate with allies and partners. But secondly, even if it didn't happen, there is a reckoning in terms of our assessment of the national security space, what matters and what doesn't. We have a series of products uh, that went into that process, um, from uh, uh, assessments by the Joint Intelligence Committee to um, uh, uh, hoovering up as much information as we can have from our diplomatic network, um, to something called the Register of British Interests, uh, which almost has a sort of metric of importance of, of different countries. And all that showed to us that the international environment was changing um, um, significantly. There's a threat element to that, but this is an opportunity element to that. So new markets in, in the Pacific, more important to the UK uh, post-Brexit, but also important to very many um, other European nations. We've heard about French Indo-Pacific strategy, German Indo-Pacific strategy is, is present. Uh, EU Indo the EU has an Indo-Pacific strategy. So not being present in those conversations would be a, a, a challenge for the UK. So the sort of metrics were, were changing. And then, and then there's a sort of, um, a set of strategic assumptions. So we said something that was sort of quite punchy and controversial in the first page of that national security strategy, which was it was no longer uh, enough to, uh, and we used less colorful language, to cling limpet-like 
to the concept of the rural space international system. That's not because we were in any way repudiating it. Um, one of the sort of sort of key aspects of UK foreign policy since 1945 is that we, ha having had a significant role in riding that, riding it, both in its post-45 version and its post-1989 version, it was absolutely of benefit to us to preserve it. But a recognition that it was far more, the international order was far more under contest, that the very riding of the rules was being done on the basis of power, different strategic uh, dilemmas and, uh, 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 and debates. And this return of interstate competition was, was having an, a profound impact on the international order. So therefore, we had to, ad we had to adapt to it. Um, I once wrote a note for one of the thousand prime ministers I've served um, just a bit of analysis on, on, on sort of posture and attitude to, 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 to the inter international system in which I said, look, there's essentially in the G7 uh, uh, sort of two types of behaviours among core G7 partners. You need to extend that out to what some people call the D10, if you take in Australia or, or Republic of Korea. There was those who had preferred a more ambient approach to the international system and would focus on more the sort of the multilateral picture or some of the transnational issues. And then there was the nations who are more kinetic or activist in, in their posture. And our essential argument, and I think you've seen it over UK policy of Ukraine, is that we had to shift into the more kinetic and activist uh, approach, sometimes with gnashing of teeth uh, in different parts of, parts of government. Uh, and that, that was a sort of uh, significant factor. There's also a fundamental recognition, and you, you, many debates over the uh, size extent of our budget, many debates over the size and extent of our, our defence budget, uh, and also our, our international development budget, and the amount we spend on intelligence. The simple story over the last five and a half years that, is that we spend a considerable degree more on defence, uh, and because we spend a considerable degree more on defence, we spend a considerable degree less on international development. Um, and that, that's been a sort of simple story. Now, most that, that's been quite painful to explain and to argue. There's a massive questions over whether it's enough in one quarter or another. Uh, but I think that that story is probably justifiable against quite a tight, tight resource environment. And then, and then, and then fi final observation, which is on the sort of fundamental strategic assumption. So our strategic language has changed. Often in the UK national security debate, we sort of catch the cold over strategic fashions that begin in the United States. But just reflecting on uh, Japan's journey, Australia's journey, there was also quite a significant American journey in terms of how it assessed and, uh, and began to sort of rethink the China question. Um, and you can date that to uh, perhaps second term Obama administration, but a kind of massive shift of consensus across the, across the aisle that on a range of indices from science and technology to trade to the economy uh, to the military balance, uh, that America had to sort of rethink its sort of uh, fundamental national security habits, posture, and position. And that's happened closely with American allies thereafter. So if I was to characterize this era among friends and partners in AUKUS and beyond, or pillar two countries and beyond, there's a period of strategic alignment going on that's imperfect and, uh, and challenging. And then simultaneous to that, um, and you can argue how much one feeds the other, there's also a period of adversary alignment going on. So as we look at those national security ch challenges and contingencies, we, are, we have, and Afghanistan was both a, a deeply traumatic moment for the UK national security state, and Simon was there and, and, and saw it, but also it felt like the end of an era. So we say in a national security strategy, it is unlikely, uh, and our forces are no longer designed for large-scale large counterinsurgencies of the type you have seen in the war on terror. They are more designed for hostile state activity, CTES as well in some respects, strategic reach, strategic effect. So that, that story is, is, is quite considerably along the way. And we talk a bit about AUKUS or other capability developments. But I think those are, those are the, key, the, key, the key ideas. So adversary, adversary alignment begets uh, stronger uh, alignment among, among allies and partners, a more acute recognition that science and technology and trade are also the vital rudiments and instruments of national uh, and international competition. And there's loads of implications. We're just at the start of um, uh, uh, working that out. And then a recognition that the prospect of contingencies and our whole, the whole, our whole thinking on deterrence needs to be re refreshed. So the, 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 the national security environment, to sum up, the national security environment is clearly sharper and harder. And in both dealing with threats and trying to seek opportunities, the UK posture is that we have to move faster, quicker, uh, uh, but crucially in concert with allies and partners. 
Thanks, John. By the way, you're winning the word bingo. You've mentioned the end of the Cold War and rules-based international systems. So. There's more to come. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, colleagues can catch up. And then, so briefly then, I mean, you've talked about it already because you talked about the resurgence of the you know, bipartisan consensus. You know, any more reflections on sort of continuity and change in, 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 in British perspectives? So I think so ch change and continuity, there's, there's, there's the two things simultaneously. So, so one is an affirmation of what I call these sacred vows, a reaffirmation of them. So it was particularly important in the Brexit period for the UK to be able to be s sort of, you know, regarded as sort of slightly naughty in, in, uh, at the back of the schoolroom on one issue, best in class in a NATO context. UK think is very, very close to, to sort of NATO doctrine, NATO thinking. Um, uh, often we play this mediating role intellectually um, uh, between sort of different tensions or issues in NATO. That's been sort of vital for us. So collective security and the fundamental concept of collective security, the affirmation of the importance of that, that's, 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 um, that, that, is, that is continuity, but it's continuity plus plus. And therefore, when the first, and we were very clear in our national security strategy, by the way, there's a lot of nonsense talked about a lurch to the Indo-Pacific. Um, we were very clear, clear that the Euro-Atlantic theater would be the primary area for UK defense act activity. Uh, and we were also very clear in 2021 that we saw Russia as the most acute threat to that uh, area. In fact, we got kicked around the head a bit in Washington, et cetera, for people saying, you know, what, what, what about the China challenge in 2021? Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that, that is there in black and white. Uh, and then when the challenge came, the UK was at the forefront of, of that response in, in, in many respects, and it helped reset the broader relationship with Europe. So that, that, that's the kind of uh, continuity. The change, I think, is in the way we're conceiving of alliances and partnerships. That is more, I, I think you're in a period of hyperactive bilateralism and minilateralism. So AUKUS, as an example of that, in which you've got, uh, you, you characterize UK alliances and partnerships. Uh, on three bases, the width, breadth, and depth of those partnerships um, uh, are, are both being kind of illuminated and, uh, and there's a white heat around them. So breadth, I mean the geographic reach of some of those partnerships. I can confidently tell you that the UK-Japanese and UK-ROK relationships, for example, have never been stronger in history, and there's quite a history to, to that, going back to the you know, Anglo-Japanese alliance uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So, so that breadth, um, uh, I think, is there. Um, the, 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 the width means that we are increasingly moving on from a period in which you would simply have a defense and security aspect to your relationship, and trade or science and technology will be done elsewhere. Uh, and you can see that pattern uh, if you take the ROK relationship, the importance of semiconductors uh, aligned to that as well. And then the depth is, in, is indicated by AUKUS. So, so the, the, the depth in terms of the depth of intelligence sharing, joint capability development, uh, multi-decade programs, and the strategic commitment uh, that, that comes to that. And for the UK, that means a commitment for the first time to engage as part of a grouping in balancing in the Indo-Pacific as well. Quite, quite uh, um, significant shift. So, shift so, that is right. so there's AUKUS, there's a global combat air program with Japan and Italy, classic European Indo-Pacific uh, uh, UK joint partnership development. There's the deep ties that the UK has with the Gulf states that were maintained but are tricky to manage sometimes and maintained through, through a difficult period with the, with, the, with the current US administration in, in the Gulf as well. And there are things that are lesser spotted in Washington, like the way we've used something called the Joint Ex Expeditionary Force, which is the kind of uh, 10 Nordic Baltic uh, nations in the UK, which was previously um, uh, a sort of defense only uh, uh, sort of group within NATO that was 10 years old, but we, we sort of energized and turned into a leader's format, which has a lot of focus on undersea uh, uh, cables, has a lot, lot of focus on energy security, also includes, by and large, uh, nations that are at 2.5% or above in the NATO context and are kind of doers and actors who share the same threat assessment. They were all the countries the first to send lethal aid to Ukraine as well. So, so hyperactive bilateralism, minilateralism, I won't tell you which prime minister, but the sort of doctrine under one of those when you're approaching these international relations was what's the highest possible ambition in the shortest possible time. I think as we've heard in today's conversation broadly, that also begets us a major delivery question. So when the, when the white heat of hyperactivity goes, you know, what, what happens really with pillar one? But that, that's sort of been, 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 been the posture. Um, uh, another former prime minister, a different one, described it to me uh, once as a kind of honey badger. Uh, approach to international security. The honey badger, however, must evolve 
to something else. And you've seen that. Um, you have this white heat of Nordic, Eastern European, Central European relationships in the reset that current, the current government's going through with Paris, Berlin, and Brussels as well. Um, but but, but, but it's, it's, been a, it's been a very active period. Some relationships have been strained. A lot of them I don't think have ever been stronger. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. And now moving on to other John. So, you know, elections again in Australia next year. Um, you've had your de defence strategic review last year, the national defence strategy this year. My Google alerts on AUKUS are dominated by Australian debates on, on, on AUKUS. So again, sort of the same questions to you, John, really, about, you know, reflecting a bit on, on the key domestic debates that have influenced, you know, current Australian perspectives on the shifting global order, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Wynne. Great to be with you, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, excellent uh, colleagues to be with. Um, I think it's useful to put things into a little bit of historical perspective, and as a historian, I can't help myself from doing that. 1942, the year uh, Douglas MacArthur comes to Australia, uh, and we become part of a combined intelligence apparatus, uh, the legacy of which endures to this day. Trusted, top secret collaboration. That's the context in which AUKUS emerges. 82 years of top secret, trusted collaboration. That's the context. Um, so the other one, of course, going a few years later, is uh, Britain's joining the European Economic Community in 1970. Um, after a decade of trying, uh, and eventually Australia and New Zealand essentially cut off from the privileged trade relationships with Britain that saw Australia turn towards Asia Japan especially, uh, trade with Japan in the 1970s and 80s was uh, a top trading partner. Um, and uh, at around about the same time, the abandonment of the White Australia policy in 1967, then reinforced by Gough Whitlam in 72, 73, uh, saw Australia transformed uh, into a demographically much more multicultural, cosmopolitan country far less dominated by people like me, descendants from people from the British Isles, um, and more, much more multicultural today. Um, and that left what uh, Samuel Huntington at the end of the Cold War, uh, when you talk about the clash of civilizations, chose to describe Australia as a torn country, right? A country that couldn't figure out it's reconciling itself with its history uh, in, and its geography, its place in the world with its history. Um, and I think that's an important uh, uh, kind of precursor to what actually has subsequently happened. Um, very interestingly, when Kevin Rudd was Prime Minister under his tutelage, and you'll have a chance to quiz him on this later, uh, he's coming after lunch, the Defence White Paper of 2009 made it very clear, uh, without being explicit about it, that the worry was China. Um, and so talked about muscling up with more submarines, uh, more robust defence posture. And then, of course, uh, President Xi comes into office in 2012. Initially, that's seen as a really positive thing. He's lived in the United States. He's had a very positive experience. He would have thunk uh, with, uh, with uh, market capitalism um, and democracy. And yet we see a remarkable transformation in that time. We see the emergence of wolf warrior diplomacy, treatment of Hong Kong, the, basically the, the seizing of the, of the South China Sea, not only with the Nine Dash Line, but the manufactured islands, um, and the disregard of the arbitral tribunal ruling of 2016, uh, and then the sanctions imposed on Australia after the COVID-19 calling out of China for not being transparent, um, and uh, a surge in concern about foreign interference. This is the context in which Scott Morrison, ScoMo and Bojo and Biden get together to form AUKUS. Now, it seems like some concoction, because Scott Morrison's got a bit of a reputation in Australia as, as kind of a uh, smoke and mirrors politician <clears throat> in some circles. Um, and so there's a degree of scepticism about AUKUS that's emerged in this context in Australia. To be fair to Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, when he, uh, when, he, uh, when he was leader of the opposition, declared that they would support, the Labor would support it, Labor being the centre-left uh, major party that, that subsequently came into office. Uh, his Defence Minister Richard Miles and Foreign Minister Penny Wong then said about declaring that really very much that they bought in on this deal. Um, they bought in AUKUS, they also reinforced the Quad, particularly the relationship with Japan uh, and as much as possible with India. But the trilateral US, uh, Japan, Australia has really uh, deepened and broadened uh, as a result in the context. Um, 
But Australia is politically uh, still grappling with this, in part because I think there's been a wariness in the government to really deal with the substance of why we need AUKUS. And there's obviously a couple of, of you know, uh, one of them is the elephant in the room. We don't need to go into that in any detail. But the, 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 the fact that China has been very much more assertive, uh, adversarial, uh, and what I tell my students, uh, it's been undertaking unrestricted competition riffing off the title of that book, Unrestricted Warfare, uh, the, 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 what we're facing is, 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 is a, a challenge, the scale of which we have not yet quite got our heads around. Um, coupled with that is the fact that we've been reluctant to talk in detail about the limitations of diesel electric submarines. For some reason, uh, our political masters have not really been comfortable with exposing the limitations of our ageing but still very capable Collins-class diesel electric submarines, which are as good as you get in that class. The problem is not with the submarine. The problem is with its ability to stay stealthy. And that's because of almost saturation polar low Earth orbit satellite coverage by China, coupled with pattern analysis, of where the submarines go, coupled with AI and drones. It means you can't hide. It means they're no longer fit for purpose. So it's a foundational, fundamental problem with diesel electric submarines that is only overcome with nuclear propulsion submarines. Uh, so, and this is something that gets a lot of uh, concern and talk about it in, in Australia that, uh, you know, we can't do, you know, there's a kind of a, 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 a naysayer view about, oh, we can't do this, it's too hard, Australia can't do this. Uh, so there's a big debate about whether or not Australia can do this, whether the United States will actually in the long run allow it to happen, uh, whether they might recant and get cold feet, uh, and whether the United Kingdom is actually got the spare industrial capacity to help us get there. This is the, the naysayers debate, and there's a few people in this space um, that are, interestingly enough, a former, two, two former prime ministers, Paul Keating and, and Malcolm Turnbull, uh, and a former foreign minister, uh, 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 car. Uh, and um, so there's this pushback that's been happening that's, uh, it's, it's an interesting dynamic that speaks to, in certain circles, a worry in the Labor Party, which is now the governing party, but it's a centre-left party, which has got a left wing of the party, which is kind of more politically more aligned with the Greens than with the Conservatives. Um, and so, uh, uh, Anthony Albanese, the Prime Minister, has to balance this kind of very delicate balance of staying in office without um, feeding too much the Greens' uh, anti-Americanism and a kind of so-called peacenik, but really, I think, not very transparently uh, honest about that. Um, and um, the fact that <clears throat> they don't want to give the Conservative uh, so-called, you know, we call it the Liberal National Coalition, which is the Conservatives of Australia, any political oxygen to allow them to win office. So, you know, in, in democracies, it's a, it's a zero-sum binary of who wins office, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's deeply problematic for, for the government as they try and make the case. Now, this is reinforced by the fact that the government, uh, at the outset, when they declared this, uh, Richard Miles said it was going to cost $368 billion over 30 years. Now, that was the sticker shock of that was truly... Uh, the bow waves of that we haven't quite grappled with. Um, what they didn't do was say, well, what, is, what, is, what are we comparing with, apples or oranges? Because $368 billion over 30 years, if you amortise that, that out, it's actually not a huge difference. But if they did, nobody stopped to compare it with uh, welfare, education and health insurance, which is uh, over 30 years, about $9 trillion Australian dollars. So when you put it in those terms, it's actually... You know, it's still a lot of money, but it's, it's, you know, it's understandable. Um, in addition, the government, wary of being seen as spending too much on defence by the left wing of the party, and particularly, you know, critics on the, on the left, um, are trying to pay for AUKUS out of the defence budget. So they're not growing the defence budget, they're just cancelling Air Force and Army projects to make it happen. And that's deeply problematic uh, for Australia holistic defence. Um, now, so the AUKUS is still viable in this context because it's mostly about nuclear propulsion submarines as well as Pillar 2, uh, which is happening. But there's a real problem here with the small to medium enterprises in Australia that saw AUKUS as a wonderful opportunity, but is, um, and, and the concerns about ITAR, 
partially uh, lifted, but not completely, um, and a real concern um, that, you know, with the need to go from just-in-time to just-in-case supply, which COVID reinforced and, of course, uh, China's actions in recent years have kind of brought to the fore, um, there's a real a recognition of the need for heightened resilience, but there's also a concern that this is, uh, to a certain extent, and this is the message the left is pushing, um, this is all about giving the US primes dominance of the Australian economy. Um, so I put that out there because it's a really important message to be able to accurately and reasonably counter uh, if we're going to be successful with this venture. Um, so I guess, you know, that's quite a lot to cover, um, but we've got a, a lot of pain, uh, a lot going on, um, and there's more continuity than change, but there's a lot of uh, turbulence in that space. Okay, so you've addressed the second question. Not yet, and I've got more to say on the second okay, one. Carry on then. So, uh, and change with, well, so, so about the alliance bit, right? The alliance management and alliance building. Yeah, yeah so I mean, it's very interesting, you know, the return of Britain, if you like, uh, it's really welcome in Australia, uh, by and large, by the major parties. Um, but there is a degree of concern that, you know, this Britain's walked away before, and Britain today is not the Britain of, of the British Empire, which, you know, Australia fought two world wars supporting. Um, so there's a, uh, over 100,000 dead fighting in support of the British Empire. Um, so there's a concern that, you know, we... Uh, Britain's looking for itself, understandably. Australia is too, the US is too. But we need to, we're hoping, and hope isn't a plan, but we're hoping that the three nations will actually rise above the petty uh, squabbles of their own democratic systems and see the importance in the grand scheme of things, the grand challenges they're facing, that they need to really, with a, in a visionary way, look to see this come about. Now, for Australia, you know, we've got, we've got a number of dialectics or points of tension, if you like. Um, we have, we've shifted between forward defence to the emphasis on defence of Australia. We're now seeing that, in fact, we're kind of going back to forward defence because we're realising we need to engage in Southeast Asia. For two decades, we fought our niche wars in support of the United States and the Middle East. Um, and in, along the way, we didn't play, we didn't chew gum very well. Um, because our relations in Southeast Asia and the Pacific atrophied, and we're now having to double down on re refreshing those relationships, which we're trying to do. And to be fair, we're doing a pretty good job. We've just signed a new defence cooperation agreement with Indonesia, which puts paid to the argument that, oh, you can't do AUKUS and engage with the neighbourhood. It's bollocks, in my not-so-humble opinion. Um, um, you've got this, also this, this kind of this dialectic of Australia being a dependent ally and an independent ally. And the critics on the left saying we're just being dependent, uh, and the others would say, well, actually, no, there's a degree of independence here. Um, and there's this idea of reliance and self-reliance. Um, you know, and ironically, for Australia to be more self-reliant, um, uh, we actually need more of the kit that we're, we're looking to get through AUKUS Pillars 1 and 2. It, so you would have thought that regardless of how you view whether Australia should be more self-reliant or reliant, that it would make sense to double down on this. And this is my argument is very importantly we do that. We have also had this fear of abandonment and the com compounded by a fear of entrapment, right? So we have the fear of abandonment that drove us to, you know, really look to secure the US alliance, which is, you know, let's face it, ANZUS, it's an 800 word essay that doesn't say very much. Uh, there's, no, there's no Article 5 guarantee, there's no headquarters, there's no commanding general, there's no forces assigned. So it's a pretty loosey goosey deal, right? But to be fair, there's a lot of other ties between Australia and the United States and the UK and elsewhere. Five power defence arrangement with Malaysia and Singapore, for instance. Five Eyes being another one, which I talk about in my book, Revealing, Revealing Secrets. Gratuitous plug. Sorry, folks. Um, Revealing Secrets. Did I say it again? Stop it, John. Stop it. Um, um, and, OK, I, I'm being a bit flippant. Um, and um, so... There's um, a, a real sense that the universities have a role to play in this as well. And th but there's a degree of being a little bit torn because politics and universities, as you know, Ivy League's in here. There is, uh, you know, as rapidly uh, anti-government as, as they come. In Australia, you get the same phenomenon, perhaps not quite as rabid, um, but you do get a strong kind of anti-establishment sense in the universities. So there is an interesting humanities versus STEM challenge where we've got departments of nuclear physics and engineering who are gung-ho for making this work and doing hypersonics and nuclear education and then you've got the IR scholars who are you know 
all that want to just poke holes in the argument. Um, so interesting dynamics at play. This is continuity. This is change. Uh, this is the world we live in. This is the, ch the spectrum of, of the nuance, if you like, of the, of the diversity we need to grapple with. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you to the panel for some fantastic opening remarks, which went on actually longer than I had planned, but it was absolutely brilliant. So we're going to throw it open to the, to the crowd. And don't be shy. Uh, I've got a hand in the back there. Uh, James Caruso, CSIS. For John the Palm, not John the Aussie, uh, your prime minister has indicated the budget, the uh, UK is skint and some pain is going to have to be felt. So within the defense and intelligence budgets, what do you think is going to be cut? Would the SSN AUKUS be one of them? Thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is where I'm, I'm on a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, uh, a relatively tight, tight leash as someone sort of currently serving in government. Um, I can give you the government answer to that, um, which is important on the defence and security side of things, which is that the government, the new government, is committed to what the previous government outlined, which is a new target for defence spending at 2.5% of GDP, which would make the UK, by the way, sometimes often forgotten, still and by a, a good chunk, the biggest defence spender in Europe. Uh, not by level of GDP, but, but um, overall. So I think that's significant. There is an open question as the new government assesses its finances, works, work out its, its future economic plan around the budget, as there always is with the budget, about when the timeline of that um, is, is delivered. The, the second way of answering your question is the government, uh, this new government is, is absolutely steadfast, committed to uh, AUKUS, I believe the Defence Secretary said this again uh, in House of Commons uh, today uh, uh, when questioned that there, there's no uh, major debate around it. I think as everyone has discussed here there are there are delivery challenges which are profound and significant but that commitment is, is, is sort of uh, ironclad. There are uh, of course capability decisions to be taken, choices to be made. Um, I've been intimately involved in the various iterations of the defence equipment program since 2019. What's happened since then is there has been an upward trajectory in UK defence spending, partly because of the additive measures like AUKUS that have been taken thereafter, partly because of increased investment in things like the Global Combat Air Programme. But we now currently have a new strategic uh, defence review underway. Uh, that's not a whole of government thing like the last two national security strategies. Um, it's specifically around the defence budget uh, all the issues that all of us are dealing with, by the way, on public-private relationships, the role of the primes, uh, efficiency, uh, how to uh, achieve the best sort of cross-service coherence, uh, war-fighting readiness, NATO demands, AUKUS, etc. So that process is, is, is sort of being done at the moment by three uh, external reviewers, and that'll be responded to um, uh, after Christmas. So. So, you know, the, 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 some of the capability decisions, decisions are open, but the commitment to AUKUS is absolutely uh, steadfast and explicit. As I say, that doesn't necessarily um, uh, answer all the challenges, and someone, someone in this room should not be named, uh, 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 whispered in my ear, so let's all, let's all have this conversation in 2035, earlier, when, because of challenges. But that, 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 that commitment's absolutely um, uh, ironclad. Uh, Ian, and in the back, so, Ian. We've seen the tragedy of 2021 in Afghanistan. Um, we understand, you know, the limits of statecraft in the context of that experience. Mm. We see varying levels of commitment to the cause in Ukraine, not from, you know, uh, a human to human level, but in the cold, hard reality of real politic. We see various levels of commitment. And again, in Australia, shamefully, we use numbers when it comes to supporting Ukraine as a political dividend, not as a capability outcome. Um, coming back to the topic of this discussion around alliances and diplomacies, how can the kind of trust that needs to be developed amongst Western nations to confront common threats and the contiguous threat of an Russia-China alliance, which is odd in historical terms, but convenient practically, how do countries who aren't in AUKUS 
how do countries that are smaller and to sort of use the Lee Kuan Kew, you know, need to become poison shrimp quickly, <coughs> how can we use diplomacy and trust to build those kind of coalitions and those kinds of arrangements in the international systems in the context of a disaster in Afghanistan and again, you know, a differing conversation at times around our commitment to Ukraine? Great. Yuki, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, yep. So I think um, Japan is really paying attention to um, Russia and North Korea and a more strategic alignment between Russia and China. I mean, you mentioned about you know, marriage of convenience. That certainly is true. But then more and more, it is really emerging as uh, more, in your words, Sean, um, more kinetic, aggressive, and competitive. And now we're seeing this a kind of questionable Iran ag again emerging in the mix. So that really presents interesting and extremely complicated challenge for Japan because there are a few things that uh, Japan has historically deferred, um, diverted with the United States on the overall foreign policy question. Myanmar was one, and now it's, I think, more or less on the same page. But the Iran was another big one. And, um, how to solve that in terms of you know, Japan's own energy dependency in the Middle East is, uh, is almost like a you know, $60,000 question. And uh, Japan, I think um, that's why um, recent uh, 2 plus 2 agreement um, that was announced, um, part of which was um, Japan's beginning of the consultation on the uh, participation on the Pelo 2 in the uh, August as a partner. But um, from what I'm hearing, um, there are, there are certain industrial security related concerns that were raised by all the parties in terms of um, bringing Japan into the pillar two mix. So I think it is kind of on Japan. And this is where a um, couple of the, uh, some of the uh, changes, policy changes and legislative changes, first initiated by Prime Minister Abe, really is kind of come to fruition. Uh, one of secrecy law, security clearance, uh, when it comes to economic security, um, kind of a more, more stringent um, scrutiny and a foreign investment into foreign investment into Japan in terms of real estate purchase and water resource area purchase and so forth. So we just have to see. But um, I think consultation just started. And uh, John, you mentioned about deliverables. And then I think uh, within a year or two, people are really start looking at well, all these announcement initiatives all sound you know all sounds wonderful, but where's the deliverable? Mm. And I think that's when. Um, one thing, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and uh, you know, this uh, defense build-up plan, um, it's great that Japan really increased it to like 2%, but we really haven't heard too much about what's beyond. So what's going on? And that brings a whole can of worm of is the demographic graphic challenge, fiscal challenge, you know, whole host swath of a issue that uh, I guess past uh, political leaders have kind of, you know, punted down the road. and. Um, it is really coming into full, especially with the uh, current uh, um, political leaders change uh, that we're looking at and the uh, Japan's uh, ruling party. But that's a great question, though. Yeah, thank you. Chaps, do you want to come back? Yeah, I'll come into that. So, so there's, there's, uh, you, I think your question is on, on the sort of what our systems can do and what the sort of diplomatic requirements are that allow us to deliver on this sort of new national security agenda. Um, so there's the things that we can do individually, and then there's the collective alliance question. And I think we're just at the start of an interesting debate about the alliance um, question. Individually, the things that we know we have to do are, first of all, and again, universities have a role to play there, relearn some fundamentals on that more people need to do poll mill in our systems because that's atrophied. More people need to relearn things like deterrence and strategic stability. Um, and they need to do so against the backdrop of a kind of change technology environment. We need more expertise in our system, or when we don't have expertise, then we need to be able um, to reach into those pockets of the private sector, public sector, or, 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 or elsewhere that have that expertise. We have to be more integrated, and that's not just joined up government. Everyone's joined up government. Um, um, that, that's a sort of recognition in our diplomatic efforts that economic security, not just a sort of benevolent view of how trading systems work, are, 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 are more important. That technological competition is a vital part of that. But a lot of us don't have the ability to do a CHIPS Act 
or, or to generate that sort of sovereign capability as well. So all, all those things we sort of recognize and were at the start of a journey on that. I mean, it's very striking to me about five and a half years of government. I may have had something to do with it, um, but how I'm in sort of prime ministerial, prime ministerial agendas for calls and meetings, that defense and security has gone from third, fourth issue or something done in other ministries to the top. And, and, and I think that's still sort of working, working, working through our systems as well. And I think that's right and proper for the, for the period. So that, that's what we can do sort of individually. The second is as, as, a, as a broader alliance. And I, I, I push a question back then to perhaps our American friends and partners. Uh, and some people have said in the Jap Japanese case or in, in recent Australian history, you had a kind of a, a hint of hedging when it came to US-China competition. I remember going to government in 2019, you would often hear we have to navigate US-China competition mm -hmm. and or we have to avoid a Thucydides trap. That's, that's what's fundamentally changed, mm -hmm. right, in the last, last four or five years. Mm -hmm. And UK policy, Australia policy, Japanese policy, uh, 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 Korean uh, for co policy and national security are, are four exemplar, exemplars of how that has changed. And it's been expedited and the pace of that's been increased by the behaviors of those who are, are adversaries and have watched it change. Then, then wh where do we go to the next point? What's ca characteristic about those countries who are kind of at the forefront or the sharper ends of the US-led alliance system is that they will take risk, fight, be willing to engage in deterrence, uh, and tick pin for, for that purpose. And it's helped by a broader sense of community of values and interests as well. But, it, but what happens when that alliance system comes under strain? So I'd give the current administration very high marks for the lattice work or whatever you call it or on, or on the peace and, and the coherence of thinking on that. But we all know, take those four nations or others, that we sort of privately grumble about where the, where the trade policy is in support of this, uh, that there's Fractious of, fractious of things like the implications of the CHIPS Act or the Inflation Reduction Act as well. So, that, that, that's a, so I guess the question is, what happens when the alliance comes into strain? And I think the test is in five, ten years, when if those of us at the pokier end taking the pain on inward investment, uh, uh, out, 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 outbound export controls, uh, uh, risk, uh, defense investment, willingness to deter, if they start looking around the world in different places and see that the hedgers and those who are hedging are taking a different approach are faring better economically, prosperity-wise, and their security is unaffected. That's when the, that's when it begins to to, to fragment and get get stent. So I think that's a, that's the sort of that's the next that requires the next evolution in U.S. strategic thinking. And we've all been run down. That's why ITAR is really significant, actually. And it's hard to explain why it's significant. Shouting from the rooftops, what is it? Is an expansion of the logic of a deep, uh, a deeper, broader alliance system. Yeah. Uh, but the, but, the, but, the, but then, then we begin to butt up against uh, other, other challenges, U.S. domestic politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, that, so that, that's my, I think, I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good degree of to think. I just take the one example, which is U.S., U.K., uh, bilateral relations. I think it probably, it's, it's so, so, so fundamental to our national security posture. I think it lacks a sort of strategic vision, a job for a think tank, perhaps, uh, or a university, as to what it should look like in five, 10 years. Because here's the reality. We all need the land system more. The US, it's replenished, it's re-energized. We no longer talk about, so inevitably, China overtaking the US in XYZ metric. That's also changed in the last four years. Um, but it needs those partnerships and alliances more. Because it, the G7 partners and I share every year less share of global GDP and military power and trading power. So those alliance systems are more important. What's the next evolution? Just briefly, uh, uh, thinking about AUKUS in the context of Australia's neighbourhood, um, in Southeast Asia, the view initially was that we stuffed it up because we, we didn't bother telling people in advance. So we had our foreign minister and defence minister went to Jakarta in Indonesia uh, days before the AUKUS announcement didn't tell them. Subsequently, the, 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 the Albanese government's been really fastidious about engaging with the neighbourhood in Southeast Asia and the Pacific to brief them as much as possible. And what they've found across the Pacific and Southeast Asia is a really uh, surprising appetite for Australian leadership in this space on security issues, respectfully engaging them. Um, and we're seeing, so the, very interesting with Indonesia, for instance, the Defence Minister Prabowo Subianto, who's about to become the president, 
has just signed this Defence Cooperation Agreement with Australia, which speaks to their complete ease and comfort with what Australia is doing in terms of the first force posture, American presence in, in northern Australia, the submarine base in Fremantle, uh, which echoes of the, you know, the Second World War. It was actually in the Second World War, it was the biggest submarine base in the Indian Ocean. Um, people forget that. It was massive. 170 Allied submarines were based there in, in 1943. Um, but in the Pacific, so we've got, we've got the Australia ASEAN summit that was just completed a few months ago. We just had real successes with the Pacific Islands Forum, uh, Pacific Partnership Policing Initiative um, that uh, is uh, flummoxed the Chinese because they wanted to do that. Uh, and of course, what we're seeing is a, a degree of a surprising level of awareness amongst these uh, you know, the, 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 these tiny micro dot states of the Pacific of, of all, what's at stake, okay? Yes, it's great power competition, but it's also looming a, a environmental catastrophe, a spectrum of governance challenges accelerated by the fourth industrial revolution, and all of those are interacting. And Australia's engagement in the Pacific and in Southeast Asia is informed by that, and, but, you know, the journalists and the kind of rhetorical spin that's given by people hostile to this is, oh, it's all about China. There's no question China is part of this. But this is part of the, what I call the unrestricted competition. And I think it's useful to actually reframe the way we think this is not about war, but about competition. When we think about, you know, America's initiatives to get a, a man onto the moon, 1969, Sputnik that, that spurred that on, right? How dare the Russians get there first, right? Uh, and then well, uh, the first cosmonaut in space. Incredible. That the competition, we see, you know, the Cold War is this terrible, you know, terrible competition between the great powers. The achievements in that context, I think we need, there's a metaphor there for how we can perhaps, if we're going to see this as a new Cold War, as see this as an opportunity to actually focus our minds on engaging in Southeast Asia and then in the Pacific. And look, to be fair, that's one of the reasons why I'm in Washington for this job. I'm here to help foster an awareness of Southeast Asia and the Pacific because it matters to the United States. It matters enormously to Australia. But we're sharing a lot of the, the same issues. They look different from down under, though. Uh, and so I'm trying to encourage American policymakers, educators, and future, future educa uh, policymakers, people studying here, to look at studying in Australia, understand what the world looks like from down under, because from there, you see the Pacific, you see Solomon Islands, where the Battle of Guadalcanal was fought in, in 1942, the major land battle of 1942 in the Pacific. Why was it there? Because it was made, remarks were made earlier, it was about isolating Australia from North America, right? This is, these dynamics are at play. It's different today, it's not 1942, but great power competition is going on and it's unrestricted and we need to be mindful of that. Thank you. Good, thanks. And there was a question with the chap in the red, I think. No, that's gone. Too late. Too late? Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead. Down here. We'll take another couple of questions, perhaps. We've got about five minutes to go. Hi. Um, well, we just had brief mention of Russia, but I was wondering, how far does uh, the area of responsibility of AUKUS really extend? Because we also talk about Indo-Pacific. So does that include like uh, the, sorry, the uh, Indian Ocean and uh, then the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, even the Red Sea maybe, and going up further north, we have, have Japan and then the Korean Peninsula. And would it extend up even to the Arctic maybe? Or if you wanted to think about it more simplistically, uh, uh, where would you draw the nine dashes of where the uh, sphere of influence <laughs> is for AUKUS? And, and I, I should have said it at the beginning, my name is uh, Jack Krapansky. I'm unaffiliated. Great. Who's going to tackle that then? Oh, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, so it's about AUKUS, yeah. And, and if we're talking pillar one, it's about nuclear propulsion submarines. So let's face it, Australian submarines travel far and wide already. They're based out of Fremantle in Perth, Western Australia, but they take a long while to get anywhere, right? For generations now, we have been operating in the South China Sea, in the Indian Ocean, and through the, the various choke points, the Malacca, Lombok, Sunda, Weta Straits, okay? That's our patch, right? That's what we do. We've been doing this for generations. There are people out there who say, oh, you know, nuclear propulsion submarines are very, very offensive <laughs> because you're gonna be operating in the South China Sea. Well, excuse me, but wake up and smell the coffee, like, ladies and gentlemen. We've been doing that literally for generations. Um, it's just we're gonna be doing it with far better subs. Um, now, this is, and I put this to you because 
this is in America's interest. And I want to make this point to those who maybe are sceptical about giving Australia nuclear propulsion submarines. This is really important. This is the quid pro quo. We are giving you access to the second suitable piece of real estate, Fremantle. The first one being Pine Gap, right? Fremantle is a game changer for American nuclear submarines operating in the Indian Ocean and through the choke points of Southeast Asia. They had direct line of sight access to those choke points, which you do not get from Hawaii, right? You have to have us with nuclear propulsion submarines. If we don't get them, this is politically toxic for Australian politics, okay? We have a fine balance. The overwhelming majority of Australians are supportive of AUKUS, but if you don't back us on this, if you walk out of this, watch that unravel, okay? Australians have a fear of abandonment. It's been longstanding. It goes back to before 1942. It goes back to the Russians in the, 19, in the 1850s, okay? But uh, we are, like everybody, we place our national interest first, but we see our national interest as overwhelmingly overlapping with American interests and to a large extent British. So just bear that in mind. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Any more comments for that one? No? Okay. You've got two minutes to go. No, we're going to get closed off. I was going to say this is the end of the A-Team warm-up act off. For, 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 for Kevin Rudd. So I'm going to hand over to you. So thanks for the panel. Yep, thanks, Wynne. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Thank you. <laughs>